So good morning. Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome uh, uh, Professor Celia Morgan to Ishka. It is our privilege to welcome you uh, and all of you here today. Um, this is a very auspicious day, the day that we begin our collaboration, official collaboration yes. uh, with the Clinic of Change. Um, this year marks the 60th uh, um, anniversary of ISPA. We've always been uh, very innovative in our approach. And um, this collaboration offers us another uh, opportunity to be innovative and to be in the forefront of, men of mental health issues. So it's, uh, again, I'm, I'd like to stress a very, well, a very uh, warm welcome to each of to Professor Cecilia Morgan. And um, let, the, the, let us commemorate, commemorate remember it today as a, the beginning of a very fruitful uh, partnership Certainly. and a partnership that will deliver answers to uh, mental health um, issues and mental health uh, challenges. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you. So for myself, I'm Claudio Carmona, and I'm responsible for this project that is the Clinic of Change that essentially promised to deliver an innovative method for mental health. And today, uh, I'd like to, to begin to uh, give a warm welcome and also a big thank you to Ishpa to welcome us in their home and to Dr. Katerina for uh, the big reception that made us. So thank you very much. Um, and essentially today we'd like to do a, a lecture by Professor Celia Morgan that I will present in a brief minutes um, to talk about this kind of method, this therapeutic. We are a clinic that specializes in uh, mental health problems in uh, psychedelic treatment with psychotherapy, um, particularly with ketamine. And in partnership with Awaken Life Science, that is a, an international partner, that professor also leads an investigation in this matter and is a reference in this kind of matter. Um, so without no further ado, I will present the, the professor so we can watch a brief video of uh, the mental health problems and how we would like to address it. And uh, first, and then give um, uh, space for, for, for the lecture of the Professor Celia. So, Professor Celia, um, first of all, she's a, an enthusiast and also uh, one of the most respectable persons in this matter of ketamine and also research of psychedelic, particularly in addictions and alcohol problems. So she's a professor of um, psychopharmacology at the University of Exeter and the University um, of London. Um, she uh, did her undergraduate degree and, and PhD at the University College London also, and completed a scholarship program at the Yale University. Um, after completing her PhD, Professor uh, Celia worked at the University of Melbourne in Australia as a visiting research fellow, returning after to the University College of London for a fellowship and then a lectureship. She joined in the University of Exeter as a senior lecturer in 2013 and was given the chair of psychopharmacology in 2015. She also holds an honorary readership at the University College of London and is an academic lead for both Exeter and ETAP. Um, she also leads an investigation for ketamine reduction for alcohol relapse in partnership with Awaken, that is our international partner and the methodology that we are going to apply here in Portugal. So uh, as final words, I'd like to welcome you all and have a good lecture. And we'll see just a brief video of how we are like to address this kind of topic. And again, thank you very much to all.
So thank you very much for that introduction. And I'm glad you um, and Katarina for um, having me here in this beautiful institution. And uh, sorry that I can't speak Portuguese, or, <laughs> so uh, I will have to do the talk in English. I'm trying to speak slowly um, and seem to speak fast. Um, yeah, okay. Can we oh, is it right? Yeah. Yeah, nice. One. Thank you. Um, yeah, so it's my great pleasure to be here today. Um, and yeah, just reflecting on the video is absolutely beautiful. Um, I was at the clinic yesterday, and it's an amazing um, setting. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today um, is focusing on ketamine assisted therapy for targeting addiction. Obviously, um, at the clinic of change. As you just saw, ketamine is offered for a, a variety of mental health issues, and I think we'll touch on that a little bit. Um, but I'm going to be talking, give you a kind of general introduction to the space, and then uh, talk a bit about the work that we've been doing over the past few years. Um, so, sort of, I guess. Okay. No, no longer. Oh, maybe it's just my fingers. <laughs> so <laughs> the side at the end is still very good. I can never get all these people in one place at the same time. So just thanking all the people that have been involved with this work really um, across the, uh, the, the years. Um, so again, and I saw the talk, you know, novel approaches to addiction treatment, but I just wanted to acknowledge that these um, ways of working really owe a long lineage to Indigenous people. I like this quote from Maria Sabina, who's, you know, who um, was the person who, R. Gordon Wasson, who was a, a microcologist and banker, um, discovered magic mushrooms and brought them to the West. So, and that was through um, he, him approaching Mar Maria Sabina. And this is her quote, which I, I think is really nice. Before Wasson, nobody took the mushrooms only to find God. They're always taken for the sick to get well. And um, so we do owe a long lineage to indigenous um, traditions. Um, and just thought it's good to acknowledge that there. Um, more recently, again, playing novel approaches to alcohol treatment, but um, this kind of approach has been around maybe since the 50s. And I suppose the first person really to take this approach in kind of modern Western medicine was Humphrey Osmond. Um, if you've not heard of him, he's the guy who coined the term psychedelic um, in a letter to Aldous Huxley from uh, the Greek psyche, which I'm sure you all <laughs> know what that means in this institute, and, um, and Delos for manifesting, or kind of idea of mind or soul manifesting um, substances. And Osmond, he was a British psychiatrist working in Canada, um, but he used um, LSD in the 50s to try and treat alcohol problems. Um, and his rationale for this really wasn't anything about the mystical experience or any engagement with therapy was because he had observed that people who were having delirious tremens from withdrawal from alcohol were more likely to stay abstinent. So he was trying to replicate that. Um, so he was trying to replicate the kind of hallucinations that you get from extreme alcohol withdrawal. Um, and what he found 
was that he achieved a kind of 50% success rate in terms of abstinence for people with very severe alcohol problems. Um, and one of his most famous um, patients was Bill Wilson, one of the founders of AA, um, Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, and, and Bill was really interested in using LSD um, as a masculine, essentially, as a way to uh, counteract what he thought was the biggest barrier to people engaging with AA, which is the spiritual element, which often does turn off a lot of people from engaging in the 12-step programs. Um, so this is what Bill Wilson said of his LSD experience, I find myself with an appreciation of beauty almost destroyed by my years of depression. The visions and insights given by LSD could create a large incentive against alcoholism. I consider it to be of value to some people and practically no damage to anyone. Um, I thought this is an interesting, he took LSD with someone called Gerald Hurd, who was based very close to where I live in the UK in a place called Dartford Hall. Um, and this is an excerpt from his um, LSD session with Bill W. Bill Wilson. I'm um, just showing that giving, you know, dogs on their own without therapy uh, may not be very enduring. But um, so at 1pm, Bill reported a feeling of peace. Um, oh, at 2.31, he was even happier. Tobacco is not necessary to me anymore, he reported. So early effects on addiction. At 3.15, he felt an enormous enlargement of everything around him. At 3.22, he asked for a cigarette. <laughs> um, so that's sort of made the point of me that there is a container around um, psychedelic. Um, um, but yeah, so that work happened in the 50s. And as you know, then there was a huge kind of explosion in counterculture. The psychedelic 60s happened. And as a result of that, these substances became criminalized. And other, there were other changes happened around clinical trial legislation that meant that these investigations were kind of stopped. And, but what we have seen lately um, is a resurgence of interest in this area, which, you know, probably have to be living in a hole and <laughs> not to have noticed um, that side of side. And so this is just from PubMed um, this morning. Um, you can see, uh, so this side of side particularly wasn't of, I don't know if it's, it's that, there we go. Um, wasn't there wasn't that much interest in the 50s and 60s, but lately there's been a huge spike in research papers dealing with psilocybin. With LSD, we can see because that was around a lot more at the time, you see this drop off and then a huge return in interest. And this is what people, what I got into them, is termed the psychedelic renaissance. And um, so now there's a huge research interest in the area, and psychedelics have become very popularized in, in the extent that in the UK, even. Our previous Prince Harry has taken psychedelics now to cope um, with grief, apparently. Um, so, yeah, hugely popular amongst all sorts of people. Um, and this has been followed, you know, in the alcohol literature um, by this kind of early research looking at the use of these compounds in treatment of alcohol. Um, so two such approaches, this is Michael Bogenschutz, who um, was at the University of New Mexico at the time, he's now in New York, um, is looking at psilocybin to treat alcohol problems. And this was these are both a kind of open label studies. So with a very small number of people and everyone gets the drug. Uh, but what you can see, sorry, it's really impossible to read, um, but is this is after the first drug session. Um, and these are number of uh, heavy drinking days and drinking days in general. You see this massive drop off of psilocybin treatment, which is maintained, this is up to six months. Um, this is my colleague Ben Sesson's study, and that's up to nine months. Um, similarly, so in both of these approaches, um, the drug was given, I think, with the psilocybin, it was three sessions, um, and this MDMA was, again, a similar number, um, embedded in eight sessions of therapy with two therapists, for, so quite over quite long periods of time. Um, <laughs> sorry, this is recently published last year. Um, this is a, a, an actual trial, a phase two trial in, with psilocybin um, with 93 um, patients, uh, Michael Bogan shoots his study. So they had 12 sessions of psychotherapy here with two therapists and each one um, quite, over quite long duration. So they were present for around six hours and two medication sessions embedded in these therapy sessions. So four, four sessions of therapy, a session with psilocybin, four sessions, a session of psilocybin, four sessions. So, um, and what they found was impressive, again, reductions. They had an active placebo here called diphenhydramine, which is an antihistamine, so it used to kind of um, <clears throat> against allergies. Uh, you know, I'm sure you know what antihistamine is. And we did see actually in this study, there's actually quite impressive reductions in drinking with an antihistamine. 
Um, so this is an interesting approach, um, but psilocybin um, is not legal for use in medical practice. And, and this is quite intense um, in terms of resource, the number of therapists needed and over the time period. So it's quite a long, and we can see, I think that's probably what's responsible for these really good effects even with an antihistamine drug, is simply having that much therapy you know, over that period of time. Um, but we, we kind of, in our research, <laughs> um, we're interested in taking a different approach because there's a compound that's very similar, you know, in some ways similar to psilocybin and available now um, out there. It's on the World Health Organization list of essential medicines. Has some very strong, it's called a dissociative anesthetic that has a kind of very fun of subjective effects so that's quite similar a number of psychedelic substances but it's very safe to use you know it doesn't um it's, it's been researched extensively and it's available in hospitals all around the world and it also has a, a shorter half-life so it's got a shorter duration of effects um which means it's somewhat e easier to use clinically because the, the duration of effects are very are shorter than with something like psilocybin or EGMA. um so yeah, and ketamine works. I mean, this is ketamine is in under a class of drugs named as hallucinogens. This is just in the kind of psychopharmacology Venn diagram, um, but it's in a subclass called dissociative anesthetics, uh, which was coined. You know, ketamine was synthesized back in 1964 um, as an anesthetic, and this term dissociative anesthetics was coined by the wife of the person who synthesized it, um, and includes a co other compounds like nitrous oxide. Um, and phenocytidine or PCP. Um, and this was to do with the dissociative state, state that people seem to be in when people seem to be kind of separate from their body. And that's partly what makes ketamine such a good analgesic anesthetic. It works in a different way to the kind of classic psychedelics, or even MDMA. So classic psychedelics work on the 5-HT2A receptor, MDMA working on the 5-HT transporter, but ketamine works on the m methyl D. Um, uh, as the Svato receptor in the brain as an antagonist, so it blocks that receptor. And um, so it's quite, quite different in action. But it does have a profile of uh, subjective effects, which are quite similar. And this is why we thought this could be a really good candidate to use for these kind of therapies. Um, so when we speak to people about the subjective experience of ketamine, sorry, that has tripped off the side. <laughs> um, but never mind. Um, at very low doses, it has almost stimulant properties. And then at higher doses, you get this kind of sense of melting into people or things. At higher doses still, people report things like feeling as big as the universe or as small as an electron. And then we get kind of visual hallucination. But at higher doses, we get what we use with the drug called the payload. It's a very kind of catatonic state where people are completely separate from the outside world. Um, so these effects limited the use of ketamine um, as an anesthetic, really, because people were coming around from ketamine anesthesia reporting these really weird um, effects and kind of out-of-body experiences, very confused, often delirious. And they made the drug attractive to recreational users. And so there is a non-medical use of ketamine in the world, and it's something that I've studied quite extensively. Um, so at the moment, it's still very relatively niche in the UK. It is the highest it's been. Um, so this was in 2021. Um, and overall, I was looking, you know, this morning across Europe, there has been an increase in the number of people entering treatment for treatment problems, but rising from very small levels from 93 to 414 across this period. And when, if people do develop dependence on the drug, which can happen when people use the drug repeatedly, um, it does have some really serious physical health problems associated with it. The most serious of which is ketamine, um, uh, uh, like uh, ulcerative cystitis, so it's re related to ketamine, and it seems to have kind of almost direct toxicity on the bladder lining, uh, which causes it to harden. This only happens, so we've done a lot of work around users, and it only really happens that people are taking very high doses every single day. So some of the users we've worked with be using things like five grams of ketamine every day. So this happens in a minority of people. It's something we're watching out for in all of our work. Um, but it's still at relatively low levels, I think. Um, but yeah, it's important. But and, and you know, it has emerged um, over since really the ket ketamine was synthesized in the sixties. There has been there have been reports of non-medical use of ketamine. Right, not doing very well um, with the pointer. Um, but before the non-medical use of ketamine was investigated, um, 
there was some work looking at ketamine as a therapy in alcohol problems, um, which was conducted by this guy, Eugene Kapitsky. Um, so he's a Russian psychiatrist working up St. Petersburg. Um, and he reported in this paper the results of 10, 10 years of research, really, where he was giving inpatient people being treated for alcohol problems um, three very high doses of ketamine embedded in a kind of um, transpersonal uh, psychotherapy program and a kind of group program. Um, and I've generally reported these really amazing effects. Um, so it wasn't a kind of controlled study, it was just a treatment as usual control group. Um, but I've generally reported that giving ketamine and the psychotherapy um, to people at, so when, when people looked at 12 months, so this is 12 months following the treatment, there was a 14% reduction in relapse rates in the group given ketamine and psychotherapy compared to control. So really absolutely transformative, um, and unlike any other treatments out there for alcohol. Um, unfortunately for Evgeny, because of these emerging reports of um, ketamine abuse um, in 1999, which is around the time he published this paper, in the US Congress classified case, ketamine as having a high abuse potential um, and saying it could create severe dependence. So it was rescheduled in Russia where Jenny was working, Putin, who was in power in 2003, which is quite terrifying, um, opted for a total ban, even on use by vets. And then in bizarre turn of events, um, Bridget Bardot petitioned Putin for the poor animals that they need their ketamine. Mm -hmm. So he reversed the ban for animals so humans. So, um, yeah, which is really unfortunate. So, yeah, so animals allowed to get to it, but not humans. And sadly, that ended up Jenny's work, which um, was such a uh, yeah, shame, really. And then, in terms of ketamine assisted therapy, things were quite quiet for a while. But what's happened over the past couple of decades is that ketamine emerged really as a rapid acting antidepressant drug. And this is Carlos Serrati's paper, and Carlos Serrati works in NIH in the US. I'm showing some of the first. This is really the first trial that showed these rapid acting antidepressant effects. And these caused a lot of excitement in psychiatry because this was hailed, you know, as one of the biggest um, developments, you know, in, in the past century, really. Um, unlike SSRIs, which take two weeks to work to, to people with treatment resistant depression. Um, then um, <laughs> and, yeah, sorry. Oh, if you can meet, oh sorry, yeah. Um, so with people with treatment-resistant depression, following the ketamine dose, we see this rapid reduction in depressive symptoms that peaks about a day um, following ketamine administration and then gradually tapers off. Um, so this is when the drug is given alone. And this has been replicated in a lot of meta-analyses. Um, so what's shown here um, in, in this funnel plot, um, so this is where, this is Faber's ketamine, this is Faber's placebo. So I'm sure you guys may be aware of this, when the diamond crosses the line, that's favoring placebo. But we can see, so the magnitude of effects, really how far away it is from the line. This is at 24 hours um, following ketamine dose in, in all of the studies. So we're quite far away from the line. Three to four days, this diamond's creeping back towards the middle. And seven days, there's, there's a le less um, present effect. So that seems quite... Well, replicated is the fact that the drug is given on its own, then you see a rapid antidepressant effect that tapers off across, across a number of days. I mean, all of this work, there's been so much work in this field, and has led to the licensing of um, this unusual looking device, which is intranasal ketamine, as ketamine, in the form of Supravate, which is licensed by the pharmaceutical company Yancey. But we were kind of interested in this idea of the tapering off of the effects, then thinking about. Um, um, things that emerged over since ketamine was discovered as a rapid anti acting antidepressant, there's been more and more research um, looking at the potential mechanism of the drug. Um, and some things that, that's emerged is that, in line with these profile of antidepressant effects peaking around 24 hours following the dose, we see changes in the brain in terms of uh, neuroplasticity. Um, and this is a really cool review, which I won't go into now, it's quite a complicated. Um, pattern and it also covers how classic psychedelics might work in a similar way. But how together both classic psychedelics and ketamine seem to share downstream neurobiological um, mechanisms that affect neuroplasticity in terms of things like growth of dendrites here. So these are some classic studies where if you stress animals, you see reductions in 
and uh, spines on dendrites and then giving ketamine seems to enable the brain to regrow them. Um, but yeah, there's been a lot of work in this area, which I won't cover, but it seems to converge on the idea that through a number of different mechanisms, ketamine might be having these effects on the plasticity that follow the time course of the antidepressant effects. Um, I was just going to talk about some of the we've done here um, as a bit of a tangent, but to, <laughs> I think it's a, one thing that we thought really was that all the work with ketamine as an antidepressant and giving the drug on its own at that point, and nobody had investigated giving it with psychological therapies. So something that might harness the neuroplasticity. Um, so, and, and that was our, our idea behind a lot of our research, really, is if we can harness this neuroplastic window, can we help the therapy embed better? And there's obviously, saying neuroplasticity is a very oversimplistic, so I want to acknowledge there's all these different types of neuroplasticity. So one that we've looked at, which you can kind of measure in humans, which is a problem with a lot of the other kinds that you require kind of cutting the head off of a, an animal, which is not, you know, it's frowned on by the ethics committee, um, is, is looking at synap synapsogenesis, so synaptic plasticity. And this is something that's emerged from preclinical studies um, as affected by Gexman. Um, so some recent work that we've done uh, has been looking at plasticity in humans, and this is kind of track the neuroplastic window. Um, so, um, we know quite a lot about plasticity and how it happens in the brain, and it's essentially um, when two neurons become co-activated that the, the synaptic um, currents required to activate them become less. So um, this was described by William James back in 1890, when two elementary brain processes have been active together or in immediate succession. One of them, on reoccurring, tends to propagate its excitement in the other, rather more snappily described by Donald Head in 1949 as neurons that fire together, wire together. And typically this is looked at in animals, so this is in the hippocampus of uh, rodents, um, and is looked at by implanting an electrode, which stimulates um, like two adjacent cells, um, and then a recording electrode in a nearby cell. So by stimulating the current in this cell, you reduce the postsynaptic potential in that cell. Um, obviously you couldn't do that in humans, um, but someone discovered that you don't actually need to implant electrodes to do this. Um, that you can look by um, stimulating, sorry, <laughs> the wrong one, stimulating, um, using visual stimuli instead of this stimulating electrode. So this is something we've been doing um, with a colleague of mine, Alex Shaw, um, looking at long-term sensation in humans. Um, I'm very excited about this because it does enable us to kind of track this plasticity uh, across humans. So this is, the, I mean, we've literally just analyzed this data, so I thought I would present it here. Um, but this is the kind of paradigm, I don't know if anyone's familiar with this, but we show basically ratings of stimuli, these sign gratings, quite slowly of two orientations. And then we show a very fast burst of one, one, um, one orientation here, which is called the tetanus. So this is akin to, in the rodents, the kind of the stimulating electrical impulse. Um, and it stimulates the visual, <laughs> visual cortex in the same way. And so this should evoke a kind of long-term potentiation to this particular orientation. And then we test that again after the tetanus, so the kind of early post tetanus phase. This late phase is meant to be most indicative of plasticity. Um, yeah, so I guess the most important thing that is the key. So we look at this late post tetanus. Uh, what we've done, I don't know, I probably don't have time to go into this too much now. We've been looking in gamblers um, with ketamine, and we've been looking at some memory reconsolidation stuff, which I'm happy to talk about afterwards. Uh, but just to say there's a paradigm here, the red is the brains. So we, we do a baseline measure of plasticity and then we do it on A3. And we follow the same procedure here where um, we give the pre tetanus this kind of burst of visual stimuli and then look. Um, and what I was really pleased, so we look at this four hours following ketamine. Um, in our participants, but we were just trying to find a signal whether this is something maybe we can measure in some of our other studies. And what we have found, um, and this is in, so sometimes this, oh, there you go, got a lovely spinning brain. And um, so this is just averaging across all the electrodes, which um, produces a virtual electrode in the brain. And what we have found, the kind of take home thing, is that yes, on the day that people had ketamine, we see this increase in plasticity for hours following ketamine um, in terms of this visual long-term potentiation. So it's really early data um, that, um, you know, but I think it's something potentially we could look at 
And so we did, so I think, and there's very, I mean, there's a couple, one study from a group in New Zealand, but there's very little evidence in this kind of increased plasticity in humans. So we're really excited to be able to find this. And this was actually with quite low dose oral ketamine. Um, so moving on to oops, our kind of clinical work, um, as I mentioned, so there's been all this work at the time that I see <laughs> this program in uh, depression. We're just giving the drug on its own and these transformative effects but there were short lasting so they seem to remit after um about a week or in some people two weeks but not long long lasting and we wondered really given what was known about the plasticity in the brain and um, could we enhance the, the treatment effects of ketamine if um, we gave therapy during this plasticity window um, and thinking back to Jenny's early work, you know, thinking there was no idea of the mechanism by which that was working at the time. So that was just a kind of uh, hypothesis we put forward. And also there hadn't been any recent work in alcohol use disorder. Ketamine at that time was contraindicated for use in people with alcohol problems because of it being hepatically metabolized. And um, so these are the kind of research questions um, that were underpinning our work. And um, so we set out to run a kind of phase two trial, um, which was funded by our, I, I, I've got big awake sign there, but it's actually funded by our Medical Research Council in the UK, um, and so we can go involved with it later on. But um, this, so with this trial, we, um, it's, a, a, it's small, but it's a massive pain to run, as clinical trials are, but anyone who's ever run them. And we had 96 patients, um, and they were randomised to one of two conditions, to either receive, um, so 48 of them got three infusions of ketamine, they made milligrams per kilogram over 40 minutes, and um, half of them got three infusions of placebo, which was just saline, again, over 40 minutes, so all the same. And then within each group, we gave people a, a kind of therapy, which I'll talk about in a minute, or a sort of what was meant to be a control for the therapy, which is education about alcohol problems. So not really psychoeducation, just very concrete education of facts and figures about alcohol. So we had a kind of ketamine therapy, ketamine no therapy, placebo therapy, placebo no therapy groups. Um, <laughs> ooh, oh no, I've gone too far. Um, and this is the kind of psychological therapy, I don't know why that's put up, um, was um, seven hour, so these were our very manualized sessions. And our idea here was within our NHS, this kind of, um, we have these low intensity psychological well-being practitioners who are very used to running kind of CPT manuals. So we we really manualized our sessions and we based it on evidence-based therapies because it was kind of, um, this was funded by our medical research council. So we wanted to use some of the existing evidence-based therapies in psychology. Really, I mean, we tried to include some other aspects, but essentially these were using mindfulness-based relapse prevention um, and aspects of motivational inter interviewing. Um, so requiring quite low level of kind of training psychologically, and they were manualized and quite scripted, really. So it's almost more like guided self-help um, with, with low intensity psychological well-being practitioners. Um, and they were very, you know, concretely focused on risk reduction strategies, so things like identifying my risk situation, and then a bit of CBT, restructuring thinking, and then what we call promoting well-being, which was mindfulness practice and um, some planning, problem-solving activities. And then we included preparation for men. So explaining to people about the experience and how to go with that. And then a kind of debrief following um, the Ketamin experience. So they were quite long sessions, an hour and a half, but only seven. So it was quite a low intensity treatment. And this is how the treatment kind of um, flow went in the study. So you can see it's kind of a brief intervention in some ways. Um, we came in on the first day, they had an hour and a half of the therapy or education, and then they had their ketamine infusion. So that included a bit of preparation for the ketamine. They had the ketamine infusion and they recovered. And the infusion only took 40 minutes and then they recovered over about two hours. They went away and they came back the very next day, um, so 24 hours after they'd had their ketamine. And this was us trying to target this window of neuroplasticity. At the time, we didn't have a good measure of neuroplasticity in the brain, so we're hoping to use some of this recent work actually to kind of help with that. Um, and yeah, and then so basically people repeated this pattern for three weeks. And then on the final week, there was a final session of therapy. So all happened, we, we for, in terms of fitting people in, um, into their schedules, we had to allow sometimes between two to three weeks between sessions. 
but it's quite intensive really in its pure form and therapeutic protocol. Um, and I don't really probably need to go in this sort of sense and say, but this having to kind of flow through the study, or to, to say they, became, they had to become abstinent before they were randomized into the trial. And then we followed them up. I guess this is the important thing of this slide at three months um, after their randomization and six months. And that's when we assessed our primary outcomes. Um, this is just the kind of people that we had in the study, which are just uh, uh, what you'd imagine for treatment seeking people with alcohol problems, say mid 40s, and predominantly male, but about two thirds, one third with a history of depression and drinking quite very heavily um, around a thousand grams of alcohol per week. Um, oops, I'm trying to speed up a little bit because it might have some time for question. Um, Am, are we, am I scheduled to finish at 11? So that, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> Just joking. <laughs> Sorry, I should have asked for um, Yeah, so these are our main findings that we were quite excited by, really, um, is that um, ketamine, um, what we saw, so this is over, this is at six-month time point. We see during treatment here, yeah, there's no difference between the groups, but they start to divert, diverge at three months and then further at six months. And we always think that this is something we're doing in our new study. If we follow them up to 12 months, we might see even more pronounced differences. And we saw the, the greatest effects in people given ketamine and therapy, and then the ketamine and education control, then the therapy alone, and then the placebo and psychoeducation. There's the pattern of effects we predicted. It's a phase 2B trial, so it wasn't um, powered for the interaction. Um, but but that, yeah, that's something hopefully to look at in the future. And we published this in the American Journal of Psychiatry um, last year. So we were excited about these findings. There are also some findings on... Oh. <laughs> um, I don't think I have... I might just skip over these bits. These are kind of secondary outcomes where we saw some... Yeah, where, where should I be pointing? Is that that? Yeah, <laughs> so I'm just pointing in the wrong direction. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, okay, yeah. Um, so these are our kind of secondary outcomes. We found changes at three months in rumination and amadonia. Uh, mm -hmm. And interestingly, this was predicted by our family history of alcohol problems. Um, so one thing about clinical trials is that we really challenged it. It's a challenge really to capture the richness of people's experience. So you can have all these measures, of, you know, depressed, depression measures and standardized scales, which, which we must have in this context. But then people report, you know, that they've been on a canoe floating through their mother's ear canal, and you think we're missing something here about the experience, which is really important. So um, what we did do also alongside our clinical trial analysis was a qualitative analysis um, of people who'd received the ketamine therapy, and we just used a reflective thematic analysis. And I just thought I'd talk about a couple of the themes here um, that came out of the experience, just to give you a flavor of what people experience under ketamine. Um, so one of the key themes that came out after our ketamine treatment was of transformation and what people are feeling of transformation. And these seem to be through a variety of mechanisms. One was that people reported ketamine giving them a great perspective on their personal problems. And this seems in quite a pragmatic way. So moving on with the night, every time I get something that's like testing or a problem, I just say, well, a couple of months ago, I was just white light to have that kind of sleep. At least I've got a body, at least I'm alive, that kind of thing. So it gives, I guess, people like are giving them a kind of context um, for their problems. We also had something that looks a little bit like memory modification. And this is something that quite a few people reported that they couldn't even remember what a drink tasted like. So there's always been this kind of fundamental change in them. Um, so this person said, I don't recall what a pint tastes like and a pint is my drink. I couldn't imagine the taste so instantly I was not wishing to drink. So it seems like something really unusual has changed. Um, and there is a, a, a literature that might suggest that's something to do with memory reconsolidation. Um, and one of the overarching themes, which we were quite surprised by, because ketamine is classed as a dissociative anesthetic, was this paradoxical through dissociation from the self and this kind of ego completion process, people reported much more connectedness with the world around. And that's probably not that surprising. Um, but I think it was surprising for people to hear that ketamine evoke these kind of experiences which seem more akin to a kind of classic psychedelic. And so this person said, so it was showing essentially that we're all connected, there's this connection between all beings, people, to bring us out of the prison of addiction, put problems into perspective. So that's a really nice quote. 
Um, and yeah, I wait. I mean, set and setting is something that's talked about a lot within psychedelic research and sets referring to kind of what you're bringing, your expectations, your personality, your mood. <laughs> People have even talked about a cultural set, so like your cultural expectations around a substance. But then there's also the external setting, not just your physical surroundings, but your relationship with the therapist. I think this is something that's much more acknowledged psychologically, that when we do these kind of clinical trials of drugs, people would talk about pharmacologicalism, because basically that everything's about the drug. And so I think it's not really um, in, in these settings until the psychedelic trials have kind of shone a light on this, but the importance of all these other factors and how we need to kind of control for them. Um, because yeah, in traditional pharmacological trials, like the lighting in the room is not really thought to affect people. Um, so people, but yeah, um, so this is something that came out and it was quite surprising for us really. Um, so people reported, you know, the relaxation practice, they did a practice before they had the infusion and that really helped them to go with the experience and setting an intention. Um, but also I think the more surprising was that people really liked the clinical type setting that the drug was given in. So we gave it in a hospital tried to make it you know friendly we didn't control the lights and everything but they actually quite liked the clinical setting and made them feel reassured um so that's i think it was interesting in in the context of this clinical trial um and i might just really quickly if i've got three minutes to touch on other mechanisms of change that we've been exploring and um, again this is a really recent study that we've conducted <laughs> and it's a mechanistic study not a clinical trial we're looking at really interested to find out why this drug does work. And we know, you know, we've got some kind of idea of neuroplasticity and the aspects of the fundamental neurobiological experience, but looking up out of beyond that, we were interested in um, looking at engagement with treatment because something that we see across all of these studies is much lower dropout rates um, in the groups given the ketamine or psychedelics than the other compounds. So in this study, we used an oral thin film version, which we're working on with the Raken, so that the, a quick dissolving form of ketamine that you put in your mouth. And um, people did self-guided meditation practice over two weeks. And um, so they were given, they entered into the study and they were sent daily mindfulness meditation recordings. And they came in halfway through and either had ketamine or placebo at that point. And what we found, is because I'm um, we're not got much time. Was a reduction in alcohol cravings selling the ketamine, and that sort of fits with our um, work in in, um, in people with really problematic drinking. Although this this is a single low dose of ketamine, and the, the reduction in craving wasn't different from placebo at the end of the following seven days of mindfulness practice. Um, we saw a reduction across everyone actually in drinking by doing just two weeks of mindfulness practice, which I thought was interesting. The thing I found most interesting was when we looked at engagement with practice. So this is how much they did the physical, physically did the practice, how much they felt psychologically motivated and engaged with it. We saw this massive reduction following ketamine. So ketamine seems to enable people to engage with mindfulness practice much more. Um, and when we did a mediation analysis, the changes in alcohol craving were entirely mediated by this kind of increase in, in engagement with the therapy. So, I mean, these are really early results that I just analyzed before I came here. I thought it was quite interesting. I mean, we don't, so, so we, what we found is changes in craving following 14 days of just guided home meditation practice with ketamine. Um, but engagement, I think is an interesting psychological construct to, to explore in this context. Um, so people have suggested, you know, in psychedelic type of practice that we're colonizing the mystical experience. And so engagement is something that's much kind of firmer, I feel. Um, to look at, and it also comprises a number of things, so it's motivation, your intention about the experience. It's interesting whether with mindfulness, and we use mindfulness practice within our therapy in our clinical trials, um, does the ketamine experience provide this sort of experiential stepping stone into mindfulness practice that makes it easier um, ultimately, or does it something to do with the neuroplasticity increase our cognitive capacity? So yeah, that's just some early data, and so very quickly and um, so you have to allow some time for questions when I'm thinking about what's next um, for us so we've just started a phase three clinical trial um, which will look at 280 patients um, across um, nine or ten NHS trusts in the UK and the funding for this comes two thirds from our department of health um, and a third from Awaken Life Sciences um, so it's great to be partnering with them to hopefully then roll this treatment out in the NHS um, 
we hope to have our first patient in this month, but our regulators are massively delayed. So it's going to be December. But yeah, we're really excited to start this. And in this, we've got a different applied design. So we'll be having people having three infusions of ketamine and therapy, and then a control group that will receive a low sub-therapeutic dose of ketamine. And this was partly to control expectations and applications. We had people dropping out as a result of perceiving themselves to be on the placebo. So we thought if we tell patients you're receiving one of two doses of ketamine, that might help with engagement. Um, but I doubt it will help with blinding, which is a huge problem with these sort of studies, and um, which I'm happy to talk about if you're interested. Um, and yeah, what's also next? Um, so we're covering the, de delivering these therapies at clinics worldwide through Awaken Life Sciences Partnership. So in London, New York, Los Angeles, also 25 and now Portugal, as was um, shown in the video that we saw at the start. So I think there's a great opportunity here, and why it's great to be here um, thinking about this partnership going forward, and for us to really innovate these treatments through our partnership with the Clinic for Change, and really embed this research bed practice clinically. And um, so really excited to be here, and um, looking forward to talking about research opportunities for the future. Um, so that's me. Thanks very much. <laughs> Yeah, far away. <laughs> yeah, that's really First question, then we the closure. First of all, thank you so much for your work. I really do think it's going to be transformative, not only, you know, mental health wise, but, you know, on a society level, because alcoholism is you know so broad you know like not only people that go to clinics have this problem but you know the the afraid like the the, the numbers that are not public they are just so huge and with these results it's really i think uh, a transformative drug for the whole society and so thank you so much for engaging in this work and my question is, what is the um, difference between ketamine and S-ketamine? What is the difference? Sure, and thanks for your comments. So, yeah, yeah, we're really excited, you know, for the broader impacts of these kind of therapies. Um, uh, yeah, so ketamine is a racemic molecule, so it's like two optical isomers, like kind of mirror images of itself. So one is S-ketamine and one is R-ketamine. S-ketamine has a greater affinity for the NMDA receptor. What does that mean? Um, the N-methylene aspartate receptor. So both, that's the key um, receptor that ketamine works on, and the one that's likely to be responsible for some of these kind of subjective effects. Um, but it means, so it means when we give, in the study where we give S-ketamine or n we can give a slightly lower dose of the drug, but also get these kind of effects. And it, is the drug, is the molecule, that's been licensed in treatment resistant depression. I think, I mean, that's more for kind of commercial reasons. My feeling is both of them are similar with our ketamine, you just might have to give a higher dose to get the same effects at the NMD receptor. Mm -hmm. We think it's, the effects of the NMD receptor and the effects of the digitative transition that do cause the neuroplasticity downstream. So I think that's why it's important. I mean, essentially, yeah, they've got similar actions. One has a slightly more opiate receptor action as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, and yeah. um, that's on the R ketamine. So, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. And um, you so, have better results with that one? Or? It's quite equivocal, really. And so, some people have suggested, and I think really, I mean, I actually think it's to do with the receptor occupancy. So, you could get the same effects with R ketamine. I think it's all dose dependent. Um, there was a recent phase two trial of our ketamine in depression by a commercial company and it didn't meet its end point. Yeah. But they were looking for a sub dissociative dose. So they were trying to find, and this is kind of like the holy grail often in psychedelics well, a psychedelic that's not psychedelic that still has the effects. But I think the psychological the subjective effects are kind of key to the ultimate treatment effects. So I think that yeah, maybe they're just barking up the wrong tree. <laughs> Get some tree. <laughs> some money analogy. Does that make sense? Sorry, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. It does so, yeah, they, do, they have slightly different receptor occupancies, but I think you kind of get the same effects. You just have the tweak and dose, really, with the two of them. But we use it that in that form because it's given orally, because we can give less, um, because the bioavailability when you give it orally is a lot better. 
Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for your presentation. My name is George. Um, I work with Bill Nishan uh, in the Faculty of Kinetics uh, in the University of Lisbon. And we are uh, doing the last two years, we are trying to approach Islamic research with observational data in natural settings, not with the clinical settings. Uh, at least in Portugal, it's still difficult to work with uh, these substances in these uh, more formal and difficult approaches. And um, I have two two questions um, uh, about this. Uh, this is really exciting that we are having in Portugal these new uh, initiatives to bring to the public this kind of therapies, uh, breakthrough therapies, and ketamine. Is already implemented in Portugal for two years now, or two or three years, in the national health system, mm -hmm. uh, beginning with uh, Joan Kubai, uh, psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. you know, yes. Yes. Yesterday we, we went up, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. And, and the one thing uh, that I would like, well, I, I will, I will uh, ask first, what do you think about uh, what is the best approach to bring these therapies to the public? And and uh, because we don't have the protocols not set, we don't know um, actually what is the best approach in terms of the psychotherapeutical uh, approach, uh, uh, CBT or or more transpersonal approach like Jungian analysis, Freudian analysis, or uh, into motivational interviewing. We have a lot of uh, possibilities. Uh, and uh, we see a lot of clinics opening uh, now, but uh, there is no pro no uh, we don't know yet what is the best protocol to, to use. Mm. What do you think would be the best approach? Uh, should we uh, uh, wait for more research, or do you think uh, um, we can do uh, a good work with the knowledge that we already have? Yeah, I mean, I think it's important, you know, for people, I think it's great that some people will be able to access this now as a treatment, you know, as you say, a kind of breakthrough therapy, and that's really exciting. You're right, we don't exactly know which therapy goes best, so we're kind of taking a more evidence-based approach, um, and with the clinical change, so with the with the uh, other mental health problems, we didn't think acceptance of commitment therapy, and there's some suggestion that this, you know, this is a good fit. I mean, this is why we're trying to conduct a therapy with like my and how these substances might provide an experience for stepping stone. We're also doing some work and work, um, some of my psychology trainees are looking to try and just deconstruct the components of the therapy to see which ones work best with ketamine. So obviously, as a researcher, you might say research is needed. <laughs> um, but I do think as well there's a scope, and that's what's great, you know, that this, this treatment is starting to be provided, albeit on a small scale. That we can, uh, with a colleague at Oxford, we're trying to set up a registry of treatment providers so we can track the different approaches that are done and then maybe we'll come together to like join forces to see which approach is the best. I mean, if it might, I, I find it difficult to give a definitive answer on that one really, and it might come down to the person, you know, with the indication, with the therapist, all sorts of other factors. But I think there's enough practice going on out there will be an early stage that we can come together and try and harness that information with real world evidence. I think that's why it's great, you know, the clinical change signing this partnership like, is vague, which is where I met the psychiatrists yesterday who were delivering to me and it's about to say, so, um, so that we can really start doing research on these things. So, yeah, I think uh, looking across all these different protocols is the key. And yeah, I, a, a registry internationally of Ketamine providers, I think, would be really great. Um, and that takes me to my second second question. Uh, that, that is specifically for the uh, you know, clinical change. Yeah. Because I, I see uh, during this week marketing marketed in uh, a lot of new news platforms, um, uh, journals, and various news that are coming that are marketing uh, the clinic as a first clinic in country. That is offering such psychedelic assisted therapy, ketamine assisted therapy. But we have already have at least two clinics doing that in Portugal. If we need this joint effort to bring these breakthrough therapies 
to the public and learn from all uh, clinicians that are trying to understand how to take the best uh, from this uh, from these uh, therapies. Uh, why why this strategy of marketing this clinic as the first thing we already have clinic um, liminal mind and uh, already uh, yes. since two thousand and twenty two and uh, and also Miguel uh, mm -hmm. clinic is also doing ketamine assisted therapy. Yeah, I think I mean I yeah, don't know. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Yes. Thank you so much. The thing is we are positioning ourselves with um, a different approach or a different methodology. First of all, with the Awaken partnership that has a method that is very specific and it's like a, a, a standardized product that follows a protocol and it's very, very, very specific to treat this kind of uh, problems and also issues that we saw in the presentation of the Professor Celia. Also, we have um, an evidence-based approach. So we are the first clinic that are going to celebrate also this protocol with ISHPA and is to produce evidence-based or real-world data so we can uh, really claim that this kind of treatments is effective and that uh, we have um, a better perspective to our patients so we can overcome some obstacles and difficulties. Also, um, the kind of position we are trying to make is that we are officially licensing through um, HRS, so the regulatory entity, and also in Farmed, so we can make um, a different approach from the clinics you also said. So I think the importance here is um, we all aim to treat this kind of problem that we are seeing here in terms of mental health. The approaches we are trying to make here at the Clinic of Change is a kind of an holistic one where we try to offer um, the better treatment for the patients, an evidence-based approach also with ISPA and ISH, and also trying to make everything secure, as you said. So uh, following the off-label use, the um, uh, national uh, committees for health science approach. So um, we are trying to gather all the things that are necessary for the patients have exactly what you said. So a secure approach, an approach that is um, Comfortable and also follows all the rules. The, the, my my um, my thought is uh, we should work together and not uh, having this approach of uh, competitive capitalist markets that uh, <laughs> each one has that, the best approach. This is a unique, we are the unit for everybody is working together. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's you are being competitive, are attacking. Yeah. Well, this is a scientific meeting. This is yeah. not the marketing meeting. Yes. Okay. That's that's what I want. Thank you. <laughs> Everybody is here. We didn't have to play. So we are discussing scientific data. Yeah, I think also. No, the 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 I, I, I have that uh, approach also. Uh, Good. But that, 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 that was that was not was what was uh, showing on the news because it's not the first thing. No, I just I yeah, think but me, that, not the blame. I, I don't want to go through that yeah. way. I just want to. Um, yeah, bring these uh, collaboration uh, spirits and, and we yeah. should talk to each other. <laughs> yeah, it, it's the only way that we can advance these breakthrough therapies and provide the best approach. Yeah, yeah. The, the yeah. Thing. and two points on that, really, I think. So I don't think that um, <laughs> um, the difference, I think we might be wrong to this, to this conversation with the difference is psychotherapy and all the, the people working here. It's not psychotherapy. It's not therapy. It's psychotherapy. It's a difference. Okay. okay. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and I think the media, and um, partly, you know, the media can sort of mix up a bit. I mean, not to blame them. <laughs> not great answer. Sure. But, you know, one of my big problems with the field generally is the way things talk about the media. You know, they use the C word all the time, like, get them all cure everything. It's like, I don't think it's going to cure. You know, cure is a really, like, loaded term. So we need to kind of encourage this, so like the media to be more responsible about this reporting. And also, I think all of our ultimate aim is that this, this therapy, which we find, you know, so effective would be more widely available. So that's why we're running the trial with Awaken in the UK, the phase three, and then hopefully another trial that would mean this can be licensed as a medicine and much more widely prescribed than these kind of off-label clinics at the moment. So 
that's the ultimate aim of everyone, I think, is to make these streets more widely accessible. But yeah, at the moment, it is, it's niche, whether it's in the public health system or in private, it's still quite niche, so yeah. But having to broaden that out. I'm sorry, these are. Anyway, uh, as a clinical the director of, of clinical change, I want to invite you to come here. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to do <laughs> Tell me how to you collaborate with all, with all people that work in this <laughs> yes, sure. okay. Just to close this question to, to give uh, opportunities to offer the. And is it, is it a way to make these treatments more affordable? Because it's, it's still really uh, expensive and niche. Yeah. And, and we have to have more training. Yeah. And, and more That's why this partnership is important yes. for us as well. Of course. Yeah. Thank you, George. Thank you for your talk. I have a question. Why can't we, instead of, for instance, LSD or if it's a question of stigma, there is not less of a stigma in Catholic than in those sources. Or is it a question of only there is like a stronger and more robust data supporting Catholic instead of LSE or self-deciding for this disorder and mental health problem? Yeah, I mean, I guess it's a bit of a mixture that it is already available as a medicine, you know, it's in every hospital, um, doctors are familiar with using it, so that is a, a reduction of stigma, I think in order to get this more widely accessible, we need to make it kind of boring, because like, <laughs> people don't want to, to be doing fringe things, because they see, you know, all the true things sometimes, I mean, some people do, <laughs> but not everyone, so to get it into the mainstream, and ketamine is there, you know, you can look up its side effects in like the formula reason. So that's one reason I think that it's just much closer to being something that could be widely rolled out. It's also kind of, in a way easier to work because it's got much shorter duration of action. So to that point about when we think about scaling the treatment, you know, what's affordable in public health systems, is it having two therapists for eight hours? You know, probably not um side side and LSD in terms of duration of action are pretty long. And I do think if you look across all of these substances, across all mental health conditions. A colleague of mine um, does a lovely table showing this. They all seem to have e effectiveness within each condition. That doesn't seem to be a specificity. I think it's something about this unique subjective experience and this uh, the window of hyperplasticity that look forward to potential for change. And yeah, so two things, I guess, yeah, the, le the less stigma is easier to work with, you know, and it, it's right there. It's closer to being able to something that, that's accessible to people. So, yeah, those are the reasons, really. Um, I'd like to think one day maybe. If we will notice there will be differences between them, and you could use them all within a kind of like pharmacological toolbox as a therapist um, to access different states, and then we'll have that kind of nuanced understanding of these. So, yeah, maybe in the future, but right now, I think, yeah, just the, the pragmatics of it. <laughs> um, uh, congratulations for your work <clears throat> uh, and the initiative. Um, by your presentation, I took the impression that uh, there is le less uh, uh, studies about depression than the alcoholism, but maybe I'm wrong. I would like to hear about uh, a bit more, if possible, about the long-term effects, about six and 12 months, uh, if there is already information on depression. Sure, yeah. So there's a lot of depression, and apologies if I gave that impression, but it's really, the majority of it has focused on ketamine as a pharmacological treatment. So just um, has a drug on its own and um, there are people, so the, the way that it's licensed, so it's actually licensed for the treatment by the drug company Yancid, but it's licensed for initially twice weekly dosing, twice or three times weekly, and then tapering down to twice, to twice weekly or, or once a month. Um, but that's, yes, it, there's a lot of research on that area and there do seem to be rapid ref effects following a dose of ketamine but they're transient mm -hmm. um what's kind of lacking a bit more in the depression world is looking at it synergistically with psychological therapy and um, a colleague of mine at Yale Sam Wilkinson has done some studies giving um a short course of ketamine so I think it's two or three doses and then giving CBT following um and find that you can then prolong the antidepressant mm -hmm. effects um but that there's there's not very many studies really, which I think is really missing a trick. Um, and then there's some work emerging from because there's been quite a lot of um, off-label use ketamine assisted therapy. Um, someone called Raquel Welsh in um, in 
um, Bennett, sorry, not Raquel Welsh. <laughs> I'm getting Raquel, so I'm, uh, Raquel Bennett in the US and Phil Wilson have been doing a lot of therapy, doing ketamine assisted therapy and with oral doses. So they're publishing a kind of case series, but they've not really done any research. So yeah, it's very limited, the ketamine assisted therapy. In terms mm-hmm. of the depression literature, they have followed people up to six and 12 months. Um, and with these kind of repeated dosing paradigms, you can see you know, good antidepressant effects that are long lasting with limited side effects at 12 months. Um, but yeah, it's it's the work I think is really needed is looking more. And again, it's exciting to have <coughs> research emerging here with kind of long-term impacts of the ketamine with the therapy for different mental health problems, because we're really lacking those data at the moment. Um, and, then, and I do think giving it as a drug on its own is just really missing a trick with what we know about plasticity and we know about so in our people with alcohol problems that we can find effects still at six months so they're really of long lasting duration from quite a short treatment you know with just a few doses of the drug so why would you move towards a kind of almost maintenance model i mean some of that i think could be to do with um the kind of uh, pharmaceutical industry wanting a more of a maintenance model i don't know that's probably possibly not i think it's just unfortunate that people haven't combined it with therapy. So yeah, yeah, we do need those data. But in terms of long-term effects, back to your question, um, yeah, it seems to be even with giving the drug let's say, um, I don't know if you're talking about side effects or antidepressants. Were you talking about side effects? Or, um, no, no, I want just I was asking about just uh, the longer term. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah, I mean, with repeated dosing, six to twelve months, we do see. Antidepressant effects, so mm-hmm. they can they have long lasting effects um, and, and good, um, yeah, with limited side effect profile, really. So, ketamine is pretty safe, which is encouraging. <laughs> sorry, it's a very rambly answer. Oh, no, no, sorry, you <laughs> I think we have the first. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Wait this for... <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Oh. I think that's what it is for. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> you talked about mindfulness. Yeah. And I'm doing my PhD in the influence of the animal experiences and animal behaviors, which was a question. And so, my question is do you see any other health behaviors being changed, like the activity, diet, and the nature? And if so, what do you think is the Connection with health yeah, that's actually a good question. We haven't really looked at that because clinical trials don't really look at the kind of yeah, yeah the well being side of things. Um, but what we are doing, which I'm excited about in the phase three, is um, it was something that the patients in the phase two trial asked for was to meet other people who'd had similar experiences. Mm-hmm. So we're setting up some peer um, peer groups, basically peer supported groups following. So after the main trial outcomes in six months. And that hopefully will be an ongoing program and it's based around nature connection. So we're going to be looking at kind of connection with nature as part of that. But yeah, I mean, it's such a, an important point. We, we don't really look at the holistic impacts of these on people. We're very focused on like disorder or changes in drinking, but not like changes in positive behaviour. So I'd be able to add that in. <laughs> the suggestion. Uh, Thank you so much for your great presentation. Um, I was looking more to the psychotherapeutic approach in implementing this therapy. Uh, in your study that you mentioned, the 2023, mm-hmm. um, it says when compared the ketamine plus therapy condition with the ketamine plus education uh, condition, the results were not significant for percentage days after. Yeah, yeah. So my question is, you did a great job because I mean, you did a control of the psychotherapeutic approach, which is, that's the question. Is <laughs> yeah, it yeah. really a control? Yeah. Is it not? And how can you explain that there's no significant? Yeah. I mean, and this is a nuanced thing which some people hear me get. It's like the clinical trials. And I was quite frustrated with that journal, really, because for a phase two clinical trial, we were not, you're not meant to be powered for like clinically significant different outcomes. That's for the phase three. So that's mm-hmm. what we're looking at now for like the, but what we were looking at was the pattern of effects, mm-hmm. uh, which is a weird thing. Um, and I don't know if it's our, our funders in the UK insist that you're using it to try and find the size of the effect to, to kind of power the fully definitive trial. So I think that's part of why we weren't powered for all those individual groups, really. Mm-hmm. So, um, and I also, I don't know if we did control that well, 
I mean, I don't know. The idea of controlling psychological therapy is really hard one, right? Because you don't know what you're controlling for. So mm -hmm. the idea of controlling for anything as a clinical trial is that you're keeping this thing constant. So with, I guess it's the expectation with the drug, placebo. Mm -hmm. But I think what's interesting about these trials, they shine a light on the psychedelic trials on all the confusing aspects of, of even this idea of a placebo controlled trial. People have suggested that in psychological studies, that's kind of an oxymoron. Mm -hmm. And you shouldn't bother. <laughs> we were, what we were trying to do was control the time with the therapist. But I think that maybe within our, I think our education thing people really enjoyed, and they had relaxation as part of it. So I don't know if it was a good, a good control. But but to your point about the lack of significant difference, that was not unexpected. But the pattern of effect was in of the magnitude that we were looking for to take it forward to the phase three trial. So that's what when we applied for funding for that um, from, you know, the UK state, they, they were convinced that that was a significant effect. I guess to, to the point as well of giving, I think we would only think of giving ketamine embedded with therapy as a kind of, in, in this context of patients with alcohol problems, because um, they are, you know, it's a risky group. And um, with a drug like ketamine, I think we we want to be able to use, I think, and, and we've shown, and, and this is the evidence that's also coming out of depression, is that if you give the therapy, rather than just giving the drug on its own, you do prolong these effects. Mm -hmm. So I think if we, we probably, in retrospect, in order to show those effects more strongly, we probably would have just given ketamine on its own with no education <laughs> condition. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, it's difficult to know as well, because it was therapists delivering it. It's, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's hard to, to tell people to stop being a therapist, I guess. Right. Um, like we recorded all the sessions and we try and check with other people. Like really close between yeah, yeah. the education and the therapy. Yeah. I mean, they're still, yeah, I mean, they're still in the pattern of the effects being greater, but yeah, no, it's, it, it's a fair point. It's not, yeah. Um, but that, that's why for the main trial, we're going with just the ketamine therapy compared to the, yeah, placebo group. So. Originally, that's what we were going to do was ketamine therapy, placebo therapy. Mm -hmm. And we did show the magnitude of difference there. Mm -hmm. And I guess arguably with, with a treatment such as this, then you probably would want to give some therapy for people with alcohol problems mm -hmm. in this context, rather than it's just the substance on its own. Particularly, we think it's a very outside risk here because we're giving such isolated doses. But ketamine is a drug that's abused. If we tell people it's just the drug that's doing this, all the work, you know, I don't even know what it is. Mm -hmm. But does that then set up the expectation? Is it more likely that people will then go and like seek the drug um, in their own time? You know, so that's another condition. I think, but I, I genuinely, you know, feel that it's a synergy with the therapy that's having the effect of this thing. Yeah. But no, it's true. Hopefully, this is something we'll be able to do. <laughs> subsequent work. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> just, just, uh, the, the, the so the so the oh, sorry. 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 Oh, the, the specific manualized therapy the manualized treatment is has uh, more significant effects than the, the other three groups oh, yeah. and uh, that's important what we're looking for uh, to try to find a, a therapy that, that works against other similar uh, approaches that are not that specific therapy. Mm -hmm. That's what we're looking. And uh, uh, the, the the other question I had is about the the, the placebo, the substance of the placebo. Mm -hmm. uh, did you did you did you any changes between the phase two, uh, the smaller trial, the phase three with the more patients three hundred? Yeah. Uh, in terms of the any any novelties in the psychotherapy or in the substance. Uh, because the saline can be easily identified as not yeah uh, it's not any active uh, psych psychedelic or psychologic yeah uh, so the, the, the patient can identify easily that he's not in the yeah. in the experimental group and some studies I've seen they, they use the placebo once 
Yeah. Similar effects, uh, uh, sedative uh, effect. Or, did you be, say anything? Yeah, so that's why, and that might not have been clear in what I was saying, we're using a low subtherapeutic dose of ketamine in the phase three trial, so 0.05 milligrams per kilogram. But I think to the point of blinding, I don't even know, even with an active placebo, um, so in our phase two, 40% uh, of people in the placebo group thought they'd had ketamine. So there was some placebo okay. effect, which is good, I guess, because the majority of people didn't, weren't aware of ketamine, really. But also, even in Michael Bogenschutz's study um, from, with psilocybin, where they used a diphenhydramine control, 90, so that's sensitive, anti um, 97% of people guessed which group they were in. So there was even better, <laughs> like, guessing there. So I think the effects associated with substances is so unique that it's really difficult to blind for them. I don't know. I mean, the, the FDA just released some guidance on don't get blind in these trials, I think. Um, but I, I don't know if we're moving away towards, like, almost to giving up on it because it's so ineffective. <laughs> so all these studies, even ones that try, with active placebos, um, and Dazalam is another one people use, a benzodiazepine. They all just seem um, really, yeah, I mean, not, they don't seem to achieve blinding very well. So I don't know. If that's what I mean. I think they're quite, it's interesting compounds because they shine a light on a lot of the assumptions of clinical trials. Maybe we didn't question before. Maybe what we should be controlling for is people's expectations when they come to the treatment. You know, they seem to be massive in retaining the treatment effects or how that. Or at least I think we've, that's something we're trying to record a lot more within this study um, is you know, what people expect of the treatment. Because I think that might have to be that would be a big uh, motivator. And that's the interplay of that with the placebo effect. It's huge. So, yeah, it's a good, I mean, yeah, we're trying to do something <laughs> by having a, low, um, a lower dose of ketamine in this one. Um, but I don't know if it will work very well. <laughs> so, for the doses, one more. Yeah, so it's 0 0.05. So it's a subtherapeutic dose of ketamine. So they might feel a little bit weird. They certainly yes. won't feel as weird as they are on the other dose. And that's a big thing. With all of these compounds, they're not going to get these effects. Particularly with things like psilocybin, there's, there's so much media attention around all these substances. People come with these huge expectations. Yeah. I don't know what the drug looks like. It's very different if you're in, say, an oncology trial and, you know, like, I don't know. So, um, yeah, it is a problem. <laughs> We're trying to chart media exposure as yeah. well. So, the kind of people's expectations are getting around, around the substances, but yeah, it's, it's complicated. Hopefully, maybe it will bring some innovation to the clinical trials through yeah. working on these substances. Yeah, that's kind of Oh, we'll just give up. <laughs> Real world evidence. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Congratulations yeah. for your talk. Uh, I have a few questions. I found very interesting you uh, referred to Wilson when he was actually saying uh, in the 50s or 60s uh, yeah. that the uh, spiritual element was crucial yeah. in, in the treatment of the alcohol. The LSD would be the spiritual element. Yeah. Well, we know that psychedelics often cause this so called mystical. Experiences these yeah. strong spiritual states, and my one of my questions is that if you have data uh, confirming or not confirming that the intensity of the mystical state actually correlates with the uh, treatment success. Yeah, yeah, there are these things. Sorry, but it's a two questions. Okay, yeah. and then the second question is that um, the objective of the treatment is always abstinence. Yeah. Or it can be also a pattern of healthy drinking. Yeah, yeah. And that, that is a really good question. Um, the mystical effects have been looked at in not my work, um, but a colleague of mine, Elias Sakwa, who's at Columbia University, he found that the mystical effects, again, people with heavy drinkers reducing alcohol, but the, the strength of the mystical experience from ketamine uh, predicted the reduction in drinking. In a kind of mediation analysis. So then I, I was talking to you about this. I worked with a lot of philosophers um, at my university. Um, so, and they, uh, some of them were kind of philosophers of science, and other ones are made. And this is my point about colonizing the mystical experience. <laughs> so they are saying, you've got these scales where you're saying, what, well, you know, mystical experiences are by their definition ineffable, right? And then we have these quantitative scales trying to measure the mystical experience. They, some of it's a bit of a nonsense. And then the, the, this mystical experience, which has traditionally been the veil of, you know, theology or things beyond science, that we're now trying to colonize it and say it's a, 
a factor in treatment effectiveness. So it's kind of interesting, it's an interesting debate as well. So I kind of strayed away from using mystical experience questionnaire. One of my colleagues that we've been working on developing, I guess it's like a bit a bit less um, contentious and metaphysical beliefs experience questionnaire to make a change in kind of metaphysical beliefs like views about the universe and consciousness, which is sort of mystical, but kind of more in a philosophical setting. So that's something we're using in our trial to make to see if what typically we see with these kind of compounds is that people move to more from like more materialist to kind of like kind of psychist views of the world. So yeah, it's kind of interesting. So <laughs> that's something we're looking at. Now I forgot what question number two is. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> the success oh, uh, can, yeah. can be a better novel goal yeah, than yeah. And not on the experience. So this is something we wanted to have within our phase three trial was to go for control drinking, because obviously that is a potential and you know, working therapeutically with people, you can set that as an outcome. But within the confines of the, I think, you know, we long term say that you could have that as a goal, but we asked for six months of abstinence for the team. <laughs> So to have abstinence is your first goal. And this is, I mean, within the context of our clinical trials, it's more for pragmatic reasons, because actually we've developed these quite manualized therapy processes and they're very di a very different way that you would work to people if you're going for a controlled drinking goal rather than an abstinence goal. So to kind of standardize it, um, but we, we've got that abstinence at least for six months. I think it's really important. I think the potential is there for, you know, and certainly when we speak to people in our qualitative study, that's what a lot of them were reporting, that their relationship with alcohol changed. So it was more kind of take it or leave it, you know, and, and actually speaking to colleagues at Johns Hopkins, you see a similar pattern of things like kind of like, or it seems like something about substance change or relationship. So that maybe control good things and make it be a goal. Um, yeah, we haven't included it in our trial for the really pragmatic reasons, but I think it's really important in area for the future. Yeah, as we roll, roll out more widely, hopefully. As to that. Sorry, then do we answer? We have one more question. Okay, great. Okay. Um, hi. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you uh, two questions about the phase three trial. Um, obviously, you powered. I've, I've seen the sample sizes quite. Um, so I imagine you're powering for your primary effect, mm -hmm. a primary outcome. And then also, you plan to take into account the interactions um, in this trial. Yeah, no, the phase three. And that's a really, yeah, that's a pragmatic reason. Okay, so, yeah. so but it's powered for the primary outcome. It's powered for the, just that primary difference. And, yeah. um, um, in, in this trial, um, will you, uh, after, during, assuming there is some, we will see some effectiveness, um, do you plan in the future to do a cost effectiveness analysis? Yeah, because, because I think that would be very interesting. I, I've done that in my PhD. Yeah. And, and also, the, when you have the intervention arm under control, so the placebo, what is the difference? I can see the difference between the ketamine and the infusion, but in terms of the psychotherapy, are they equivalent? Are they both the same in both arms or are they different? And how do you control for blindness if they're Yeah, different? yeah, exactly. So we refer to the break as um, which is a really good point. Um, so with the cost effectiveness, we are doing that. Um, we've well, we've got health economists working on the trial, so they are looking at health economic outcomes. Um, not it's not a full cost effectiveness um analysis, but I mean, and I don't know that much about health economics, <laughs> but they said that would be much more money. And we're like, and, and again, I mean, the problem with clinical trials is so expensive to run, um, <laughs> even you know, one of that size. So, really, we're looking now within this one at the extreme arm. So, we've got we refer to the therapy of psychological support within this. But it has one is very just education again, and the other one it's got more therapy components. But we do include relaxation within it, so we'll have a kind of we've got relaxation and a few more uh, little and, and the preparation for ketamine and the debrief session. So people are journaling. So there's some kind of more crossover between the therapies between the two within this study. But now we've got a some therapeutic base of ketamine and a therapeutic base of ketamine. So we're that's what we've kind of powered for that difference ultimately. But it, yeah, we haven't, what well, we haven't, even a study that size to power for the interaction with the statisticians <laughs> tell me then 
We need just the, you know thousands of people. So, I mean, it's, it's a real shame. What we're hoping to do, because I think you need to do for two phase three trials, so I understand it, possibly not, but to get it fully licensed. Um, something I think is really interesting would be to do a kind of adaptive Bayesian design where you don't have to, I, I tried to do it with this one, but they were keen on this very old, kind of more of an old school design, but where we can look at different numbers of sessions as well. And I think that's something that's really important. We don't know whether it's like one Gibson session or four Gibson sessions that makes the difference. So I, um, that's the other trial that we're hoping to do. And then because it's Bayesian, hopefully we'll have a bit more flexibility within that. Um, and if we show a kind of dose response of ketamine, or will there be a peak, you know, with three three sessions, and then you see no added benefit? So I think that that would be really interesting. Lots of things to do, basically. <laughs> um, but yeah, but no, thanks. Does that answer your question, Susan? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Maybe one last question. Yeah, quick question. Uh, are there any risks, not only physiologically but also psychologically? Have you found any risks out there? Um, in terms of in our, in our trials, the adverse events are very low. Um, so physically, ketamine acutely physically is very safe. It doesn't slow your heart rate. Really, you know, that's why it's the most widely used anesthetic in the developing world because it's safe to use when you can't you know inflate people. You don't have any support equipment, so it's safe acutely. Um, as I mentioned, I guess one of the the, the key risks um with it. I, the unusual experience is, I guess, we don't include people who've got a uh, history of psychosis um, because of that idea that it might become those. Um, and then, in terms of psychologically, I mean, and we really within our trial, there were very few adverse events, no serious adverse events. We <coughs> one person had a low mood, slightly prolonged after the infusion, but that remitted quite quickly. So, yeah, it's pretty safe. It's nausea, really, in some people, acutely. Um, and as I mentioned, there is because it's a recreational drug, and there's a very you know a pretty niche group of people that go on to use ketamine. And I've worked quite a lot with them, so I feel like I have a good understanding of that. It's not something we've seen across any of the treatment studies. And I think that's about the way we you know we present it as, and this is partly to the point of you know why it's important to give it therapy that this is a catalyst for the therapy. It's not the drug on its own that's doing the work. You know, putting that loop of control back. We only give a small number of doses. It's not a maintenance renovation. Um, there are people, the company in Israel, that are exploring giving ketamine as a saving for depression. And I feel like that's really risky, you know. And also goes away from the whole potential innovation of this approach is that it's long lasting with a short period. So why would we go for a kind of maintenance ketamine dosing? But yeah, so, so no, in short, no, there don't seem to be many adverse effects at all with this. And psychologically, because I work with integration of psychedelic experiences. Yeah. And what I find is um, most of my clients, you know, they have such profound experiences and the neuroplasticity is so big that it changes their whole identity. Yeah. So the follow-up risk that I am discovering is like, I don't relate to my friends anymore. <laughs> I am not, you know, part of my clan anymore. They are all still drinking. They are all still in this sort yeah. of like lifestyle. And I feel isolated. I yeah. can't relate to anyone anymore. Who yeah. am I? You know, I'm finding myself not, you know, not yeah. able to find my new identity. Yeah, and no, stuff no. like that. That is a really important point, actually. And that's sort of why we've got this book group around the same future, which I think is really important. That is true. I mean, I think. You know, whether that's even even with people who are in recovery from any addiction, the same that sort of does happen. You get that shift from an identity as you know, a drinker or a heroin addict to an identity as someone in recovery. And I guess that's you know why AA or 12 step programs are really important. That's sort of why we've got that group, I guess. Yeah, because these feelings of enhanced connectedness with the world around, I think it's really important that, that we harness them, maybe, and that's the thing that. Yeah, but I think, sorry, yeah. I interrupt, but I think no, that sorry, the, I you. <laughs> uh, um, the, the main difference here is the spiritual aspect, and, yeah. you know, just compare it to, you know, other treatments like AA, because, you know, people that were atheists before suddenly see God or suddenly, you know, have this uh, spiritual experience, 
and they don't know what is real anymore, what is not real. Like yeah. these, fundamental, these fundamental questions about reality come up yeah. that really can shadow one's whole world. No. Yeah, yeah. Do you have any experiences um, in that? Like, yeah, you? I mean, and, and we're working with people as part of the broader kind of screen that we have. This is a work with philosophers about the idea of kind of metaphysical integration, which we're talking about, one of my colleagues, looking at how do you like work with people around these changes in your beliefs about the nature of the universe and consciousness and everything. Mm -hmm. Yes, you know, we are sort of thinking about that. I don't think that's something that we embedded within our program here. But I, yeah, I mean, no, it's, a, you know, it's an important point. Those kind of changes, the transformations that we're observing, that's so huge, the psychological risks associated with that. I think that's why, you know, this idea, I mean, maybe that's, you know, of, of supporting people to support themselves and, and have a community around this yeah. experience yeah, exactly. afterwards. I think that's, you know, because that's probably where true change mm -hmm. long term. This is a short intervention, really like boosts people out of something. <laughs> Gives them all this material, but yes, you kind of working on that all the time. I think it's really important. But no, that's really, I thank you for sharing your experiences and experiences. That's mm -hmm. really um, helpful to hear. So, anyway, I'm done. <laughs> thank, you, thank you so much. Yeah. So, thank you, Professor Pillion. I think it was a very pleasant presentation from myself in the Clinical Change team. I think we can all agree that this is uh, an interesting and a trending topic. Um, we can watch from the, the questions and the debate we have here. Um, also, uh, we are born with um, research and evidence background. And today marks precisely what we are trying to achieve with ISHP and also ISHP uh, to extend this partnership so we can do some academic research, also uh, some investigation, and also help some of the students um, integrate the clinical change and work on this type of partnership. So um, I would like to personally thank Ishpa for the hospitality and to feel at home. It was a very pleasant welcome by you. And I look further to we work together um, in terms of research, investigation, and academic. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. thank you so much. Thanks again to Professor Cecilia Morgan for this opportunity to share with you the this um, very interesting approach. Um, again, it was a privilege to have you all here, and we are looking forward to the future work that we will uh, um, um, and the future project that we'll have with the Clinical Change, namely uh, through our students our, that, that will complete our internships at Clinical Change through research, um, I'm sure. And through other projects that will certainly uh, come forward. Thank you again for being here. Yes. It's a pleasure.